the man giving the talk said that there is a way to get rid of them completely. Oh, oh. What will I do with myself all day long if I don't have troubles? <laughs> right? Nod your head. What would you do with yourself? Now look, this is, in one way it's funny, and in it, it's okay, we're going to laugh a lot, I hope. At the same time, it is very, very serious, because if you can begin to see how reluctant every human being is to give up his precious problems, if you can see why, and we're going to find out why, if you can see why a person refuses to give up his worry, refuses to give up his jealousy, refuses to give up his, his worry over what's going to happen in the future, refuses to give up his shame over those evil deeds he or she did in the past. Remember how badly you treated that person 10 years ago, 20 years ago? You know, we all know. What is this peculiar, fun habit we have of running all these negativities, all these hauntings through our mind? I will tell you why, and you listen very carefully. We run them through our mind and through our feelings and through our life all day long because we're afraid that without them we will not exist as the identified labeled person by which we presently call ourselves. Did you understand what I just said? How many understood? All right, let's go into it a little bit more. My worries make me an important worrier. Hmm? Don't we go around boasting about the bricks on our back, how rough it's been. Why, do you know how that man treated me? Do you know what that woman did to me down at the divorce court? Etc., etc. There is a great unconscious, unseen fear in every human being of simply dropping all the mental activities that are negative, that cause worry, that cause heartache, that cause pain, that cause suffering, that cause depression. There is a great reluctance in a human being to give them up because you don't know who you would be on the other side of your suffering. And I will tell you in advance on this that the question, but who will I be and what will my life be like on the other side of my suffering if I get up, give it up? That question in itself is false because, this is very, very advanced now, you pay attention, because you say, if I give up my worry, you admit you have worries, you admit you have jealousies, you have depression, how many people get depressed? Let's see the dejected, despondent people. When you are depressed, you're at least a depressed somebody. And you will find a reason for it, won't you? I'm depressed, well, and then you work real quick to find a reason for it. Right? And the reason you give is always false. Because there's no reason for your depression outside of you, whatever. You're not depressed because you lost your boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe you were glad. You're not depressed because you lost your money. You're not depressed because things aren't going right in this or that activity that you seem to hold out so much promise at the start. I will tell you the basic cause of depression, which is the same cause of every other painful heartache. The principal cause of depression is the false need for the thrill that you or I get out of saying, I feel so blue today. Because you have slapped a label on yourself which seems to affirm that you may not be the President of the United States or the Queen of England, but at least you are a depressed human being. And that, in our ignorance, we say, is better than being no one at all. Thank heaven I can call myself depressed. Thank heaven I can call myself lonely. Thank heaven I can call myself worried. I will guarantee you, guarantee you absolutely, 
but you have to find it out for yourself. That if you will begin to explore, even in the smallest way, what we've covered so far in the first ten minutes tonight, if you will begin to explore this carefully, persistently, with a tremendous amount of self-honesty, you will begin to dislodge all the bricks, whatever kind they may be, that are on your back, and you will see your, see your psychological step, your spiritual step, become much lighter, much freer. But you have to do the work. You understand that? No one can do it for you. There's no other way for any other human being to do the work for you. So if I can have the courage and take even the ounce of strength I have to begin to understand that I'm depressed, get this now, I'm depressed, I'm worried, I'm lonely, because there's a wrong part in me that has a false, false, false love for it. When you begin to give up your negativities, whatever they might be, confusion, anger, irritability, when you begin to give them up, I want to tell you what will happen to you at the start. If you actually begin to no longer call yourself a depressed person, and this connects very much with the New Testament, as you will see in a minute. When you begin to give up all your ideas about yourself, and you are not these ideas at all, you are not your own labels, and neither am I. You're neither rich, poor, famous, or unfamous, nothing. When you begin to give them up, a great anxiety will begin to come over you. And I'm wondering if any of you are thinking ahead of me to understand why, when you begin to give up your calling yourself, your description of yourself as a defeated person, as a failure, or as a success, they're all the same, just the opposites. Why, when you begin to no longer call yourself but on the intellectual level, anything at all, why does it begin to arouse anxiety? I will tell you why. In fact, it was said quite clearly in another way 2,000 years ago. If a seed fall into the ground and... No, a seed must first fall into the ground and die in order to bear fruit. The seed must disappear as a seed in order to shatter the hardness, the shell of the seed, for the seed to die is necessary in order to, for it to become a flower, a plant, tree, or whatever it becomes. When you see the necessity, the absolute necessity, for no longer using your intellect wrongly by calling yourself this or that, you calling yourself depressed, for example? When you see the necessity for no longer doing that, you're going to get triply anxious. Because you say, well, if I give up that, what's on the other side of it? Who will I be? What will I think about? What will I do with myself? Will I not lose control of my life? My dear ladies, my dear gentlemen, are you in control of your life now, the way you're thinking and living? Or is your life controlling you? Is your own mind running away with you when you have to stop unexpectedly at that traffic signal? Or you get that extra bill or someone says something cutting to you? Are you in charge of yourself or is it something else in charge of us? That's a very, very necessary question that we must probe and answer with all the honesty that we can muster. All right. Are you following so far? Okay. All right. The fear of giving up my label self Oh, I won the 100-yard dash in the Olympics and I want everybody to know about it. Or I got married 20 years ago and I still put the wedding picture on the mantel. Or I succeeded in this. Or, or, and listen to this, I failed in this 20 years ago. I put my money into a business and because I was stupid I lost it all. And my partner ran away with all the money and so on. If I can see 
that it is possible for me to not label myself anything at all. At first I will have great anxiety over it because I'm beginning to put an end to my false self, to my invented personality, to my described nature. If I stick with it to the very end of it, I will see that the death of the invented self of the surface personality is the very truth that sets me free. See, if I stick with it, but if getting these truths at the beginning and starting to fear them, I start to run away by rejecting them or going to imagination that all is already well, then I won't be able to go to the end of my anxiety whereby I could destroy it. How many of you are anxious? I say anxious, nervous, tense. You know what I'm talking about. Do you know the reason for that now? Can you begin to see the reason for it? It is very simple. All of us, to one degree or another, are living from a labeled self instead of from the free whole, capital W, whole self, in which there are no problems at all because there's no, no falsely independent entity there to cause the problems. Now, now, I want to leave lots of time for discussion before our break, so I won't go on too much longer with this. You've been given a lot to think about so far. By seeing that my primary mistake in life has not been that I failed in business or failed in marriage or that I've been defeated in this or that. <laughs> it's nothing. That's nothing. We're not living for this world at all. We used to, but we're getting smarter now. We're beginning to see that there really is such a thing as eternity. Therefore, my primary mistake has been to use my intellect to give me ideas about myself, that is, delusions about myself, illusions about myself, and when the exterior world doesn't confirm them, I get scared and mad. This is the experience of every one of us. We set up our expectations out of our false ideals connected with a false identity. We set up expectations as to how the wife should treat us, how the husband should behave, how friends should treat us, that I should get the raise, that you should be nicer to me, that you should do favors for me, that you should bend your life to fit my desires. Look, we've tried that. We've gone that route Whatever your age is, think of your age right now, please. We've gone this route up to this 30, 40, 60, 80 years, and you know and I know that it just hasn't worked. Moreover, it never will. We might as well pound our heads against those concrete blocks there is to continue to try to solve our problems the way we have try been trying up to this point. Aren't you delighted to hear that there is a real way out? Or does the prospect of it scare you? Or does the prospect of it make you feel, well, I don't have the strength to do it. You have strength to start. You have strength enough to sit here during these two classes and collect the knowledge and then by understanding that part of the knowledge is to let go of knowledge, not identify with that, not go around saying I'm so spiritual or I understand all these principles, but to die to knowledge too, that doesn't mean you lose the knowledge, it means you lose the identification with it. So you're not trying to get a false feeling of life out of it, not trying to brag, I'm not trying to brag to myself how spiritual I am. The minute I do that, I'm not spiritual, because I'm merely thinking about it. Do you know what real spirituality is? Cosmic consciousness, not human thought. Don't you know people who are surface 
religious people and you know how that they're still as scared as they have always been they're still as uncertain still confused all right I want to finish with this I'm going to say this very unemotionally very factually I know personally personally I'm speaking personally to you now that there is a way out of every human difficulty there is a way out I also know that it's more than most human beings want to do it requires more work more honesty more abandonment of self-deception more going up around the boulders up the mountain climbing over this boulder over that boulder if you see a boulder you go around it you climb over it most people want to rest rest at the foot of the boulder and go into daydreams that they're on top of the mountain but I know this about every one of you here in this room tonight I know this for a fact just as much as I know that light there I know that if you were to continue to work with these principles just even the few that we've covered so far tonight if you were to continue to absorb them that God Almighty himself would do his work because you have given him an opportunity to do so I know that any of you can change that you can be free of your tension of your anxiety because you will first first understand that it's a false reward that it's a false pleasure it is very necessary that you begin to understand the necessity for slowing down the horse which is the mind begin to slow it down and how do you do that you do that by turning the attention of yourself turning your own mind back on itself so to speak in order to watch yourself react the very watching of your reactions and you have a thou ten thousand fifty thousand of them a day the very watching of them without judgment of any kind will begin to slow the horse down so that you can begin to recognize both the beauty of life on one side and the perils of life over there how many of you have been in trouble because you didn't know a problem before you walked into it you know you knew it afterward of course what we're trying to do here is become wise before we walk into the problem but back to the original question where were you today just think so you can get into this workshop a little more yourself we were in a cafe today you worked around the house today you were down at the office or the factory where you work didn't you happen to notice your own reaction when the boss spoke a list a little bit sharply to you today or did you just simply react without knowing that you reacted and you got a little upset a little irritated maybe how about it when the waitress didn't bring you what you ordered what was your reaction to that how about it when you, you, you missed the signal that you wanted to make because you would then got on the freeway easier or whatever it was the idea is to watch everything that happens to us at the same time you're looking out there at the boss balling you out the arrow of attention is also pointed inwardly so that you don't merely react but you become aware you begin to notice you begin to see that you're reacting then after you practice that for a number of years you can go on to the next step the next step being to not identify with what you see and this is what I've covered for the first 20 minutes of this talk that is when you get angry over that boss's remark that you put the file the paper in the wrong place and that's the tenth time he told you when you get mad do you know that when you got angry or you get tearful whatever action you had do you know that that wasn't really your reaction at all it is a reaction that took you over but it wasn't your reaction if you say oh I'm so weak I just can't but get mad every time something happens don't you understand that you are hardening the false self the false angry self you're hardening every time you say it because you begin to believe in it more when you do not identify with what you see you begin to weaken the power of anger which has taken you over anger irritation jealousy is simply a foreign force that has taken us over as human beings and we've never ever heard perhaps 
before that there is a way out by a, a truly spiritual scientific study of ourselves not self-centeredness not just thinking about ourselves but observing ourselves in order to slow down the process so that we can begin to see and after you begin to see many many things you'll know that you don't have to latch on to you don't have to attach yourself to any of them because you in your real nature in your essence are not this human being who's occupying this physical flesh at the present time that's not you your physical body isn't you your memories aren't you your successes aren't you your marriage isn't you your divorce isn't you your success and your defeats aren't you you are something that is unlabeled that's above the intellectual capacity to label and all this all this can be understood and every time you get one ounce of understanding I will guarantee you that a brick will fall off your back and you will feel the lightness now go on to the next brick and the next How many of you are a little bit uneasy over the lack of questions? Someone asking a question. Raise your hand, please. You didn't notice that? You didn't do what I told you to do? Did you just simply sit here a little bit uneasy, hoping that someone would break the silence and ask a question so that you would feel easier about it? Didn't you notice yourself feeling uneasy? This is what it's all about. Do you know something else? <coughs> truth, truth is the most kind, compassionate force in the world and the only kind, compassionate force in the world. Everything else is against you. So which, which are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to live the way the world lives? That man gets a raise after walking like an idiot with a sign around the factory for 10 days and screaming dumb statements, demanding his rights. So he gets the $20 a week raise and he brags that he has victory. That man, that man, God help him doesn't even know that someday he's going to die and he's not going to take that twenty dollar raise that the labor union got for him with his idiotic cooperation he doesn't even know that he's not going to take it with him are you going to are you going to waste any more of your life living in time or are you going to begin to understand and thereby give yourself the opportunity to live in eternity even while you're here in the flesh? You can do it. This is not, this is not too profound for you to understand. It's something that you're quite capable of understanding if you'll just hit, hit the door of the castle with a sledgehammer, not with a feather. A feather won't knock down that thick or if you want to get in the castle God requires that you get a big sledgehammer and hammer away and hammer away and hammer away and when your strength is exhausted when you can't do when you can't do any more swinging it will open because you've come to the end of yourself have you ever considered the simple adventure of not reacting the way you usually react when someone upsets you when someone says something accusing someone makes a, a cutting remark or a cutting expression you know a little imp, uh, little expression of some kind that meant to uh, put you down have you ever considered the possibility of slowing down your reaction to the point where you can see what a slave you've been all your life to your own responses to life that is the beginning of liberty 
to see, to see what unconscious slaves we've been up to this point of our life is the beginning of freedom, beginning of freedom from slavery. Don't you listen to your friends. You listen to truth. Your friends, in all probability, your neighbors, your boss, in all probability, does not want these truths. He wants to know how to double his business next year. And his wife wants to know how soon she can have that new house. Are there questions and comments? Yes, Louise. When you observe that you are apprehensive on somebody else's behalf, like when you ask, when there are no questions, who the... Okay, you observe it. What do you do about it? What? I mean, I've done this quite a few times now, and I'd like to know when you observe it, then what do you do, where do you go from there? If you do anything about it, you'll lose it. Do you understand that, Louise? Uh -huh. If you do anything about it, that means you're not watching with pure attention. That means you're still trying to relieve it. For example, look, I stand here and I say, all right, do you have questions or comments? And most people are timid about such things, and so nobody does anything. And you, you even could... Let's find out, come on, real honest now, real honest, where any of you even had a touch of resentment over the silence, or didn't you see it? Anything that makes us uncomfortable, we tend to resent. All right, but had you been working on yourself, according to this principle of turning the arrow of attention back on yourself, as well as out there, you could have simply, first of all, seen that you were a little bit uneasy. You like it much better when maybe someone raised their hand and maybe there's a big laugh in the room or something like that. You're much more comfortable when the usual is going on. But all of a sudden, silence. Nobody asks a question and you wonder why I just stand here and don't do anything. Do you know why I stood here and didn't do anything and may do it again tonight and tomorrow? to make it worse. <laughs> I am not going to relieve your tension or I will fail you, right? It has to get worse. So you wonder, what are, I wish somebody would do something. Maybe the minister will do something. You know, just to, just, just to break this awful embarrassment of total silence. Why don't you learn to live with it? Do you mean to tell me that you're so out of control that you can't just sit here quietly in a room full of other people, just sit here quietly for a whole half hour if necessary? To repeat, it's because the experience is unfamiliar and you want the familiar to go on because you don't know what to do with the unfamiliar. Well, maybe if I ask a question that would break the silence, no, that might be a dumb question or whatever, you see? If you can simply see your state without identifying with it, without saying, I am nervous, if you can simply see that there's a state of uneasiness, of nervousness in you, then you can go to the second stage that I told you about, which is to cease to identify with it. That is, not say I to it. Not say I am nervous, because your essence is not nervous about anything. The invented personality is, the described personality, the false self, all these ideas we have about ourselves, they're certainly nervous, but you in your essence can't be nervous. How can the kingdom of heaven within be made upset by anything? It can't. But we're not living from that. We're living from our little surface personality that is quite happy when it has a thousand distractions, when it's in the stream of the known, of the familiar, and the minute some little thing happens, we get nervous. For example, maybe the boss, pretty nice fella, you know, maybe you get a nice boss. And no big problem with it, but all of a sudden, 
for the first time and working with him for six months, he gets irritated with you and makes it quite plain that he's irritated with you. You know how to handle his smiles and his niceness to you and his patience with you. But all of a sudden you feel nervous and upset and, and confused because he said something sharp to you. Now why did you get upset? Because there's a part of you that felt affirmed, okay, accepted by the boss when he was smiling at you. But the minute he scowled at you and yelled at you, you didn't know who you were. You begin to lose the sense of the accepted person. That you could live with. You knew that. The boss likes me. He's, he's not, he's pleasant man, pleasant. He scowled. I don't know who I am now, therefore I don't know how to behave. Because now I am a disapproved of person and I don't know how to handle it. Don't you see that both I am a marvelously approved person by the boss and I'm a terribly disapproved person by the boss are false opposites. Why are you trying to get a sense of identity out of either being approved or disapproved by the boss? If you are living in pleasure over the boss liking you, which doesn't mean he has to dislike you, we're not talking on that level. If you live in pleasure over the boss liking you, you're just setting yourself up for getting hurt, aren't you? You're setting yourself up for, for crying, for tears. What's above it? What's above it? We hinted at it earlier this evening. There is a way in which you can go down to that very same office. You can go down there every day for 10 years or 10 days or whatever. And you can be right in that room. And regardless of how the boss treats you, you can be a free woman, a free man, because you don't have a pseudo personality who is at the mercy of other people telling you how to feel. You're not at the mercy of anything. And I mean anything. How many of you get depressed over the news reports on TV? How many of you get indignant over them? How many of you get something else over them? <clears throat> you say, well, and it occurs to you, for example, for heaven's sake, the government, which is supposed to solve our problems, is the creator of my problems. Have you ever suspected that? Huh? I will tell you that that is a right suspicion. Suspicion. <laughs> suspicion. It's a fact. All right. Do you know that the time can come when you are living in this gigantic insane asylum called this earth? You can live right in the middle of the insane asylum and know its insanity without being affected by it, without it scaring you. Real honest now, real honest. How many of you are scared human beings? Do you know why you're scared? I have explained it to you. Oh, this is a workshop. You have to do some work. According to what I've explained, which is the truth, by the way, and it's not my truth, I didn't invent it, it's not mine, it's the eternal truth, the universal truth. If you were scared, I'm not talking about fear of crossing a busy street, that's protective fear, where the physical body is protected, of course. You don't stay out in a thunderstorm, you come in to protect the physical body. But if you're afraid of the future, if you're afraid of the past, afraid of all those dreadful things you did, or someone did to you, whatever, if you're in a state of fear, who will volunteer to explain why? Could it be then that you're not living from who you really are? Instead of that, you're living from the level of the intellect of ordinary thought, which is the cause of fear. Let me explain something to you. We all have a, an intellect. We have a mind what we can call ordinary thought. Now this ordinary thought can either serve practical purposes such as cooking your dinner or doing your work down at the office or driving your car or making a new dress or building a new room in your house. This would be 
the use of practical thought. And there's no negativity in that. It's good to build a new room in your house and to drive your car, right? Nothing wrong with that. That's using the mind properly. Unfortunately, we don't use our minds on the ordinary level for pure practical purposes. We use it to try to get a sense of identity. We use it to go into the illusion that I am a separate self apart from the rest of the world. Therefore, I am in fearful competition of it. Someone might get more than I do. I'm always left out. In other words, we imagine, imagination of being a part of ordinary thought, we imagine ourselves into our own worries because thought is operating incorrectly every time it says I. Just think what you just heard right now. The mind is operating incorrectly every time it says I. But you say, well, 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 if I'm not what I think I am, who am I? Who's asking that question? Someone who's fearful? Someone on the level of the intellect who's fearful of not being all these... How many of you are, are more than one person? How many, huh? how many have ten people inside? Fifty? Don't you see them changing roles all day long? Don't you see these things happening to you? How many have been happy today, you know, happy? How many today were happy one moment and angry the next? Huh? Ah, we've got two people already. Little phony happy and depressed, right? Who else? See, try to see what we call ordinary call a change of moods is nothing more than the intellect operating at the mercy of exterior events or interior ones too. You can be a victim of your own thought and that sour thought sets off another sour thought. All right, if we could use our minds rightly, the ordinary mind rightly, to do practical things, to learn how to do your, your profession or to maybe increase your business, nothing wrong with that on its own level. If we used our minds for purely practical purposes on the everyday level, because we're human beings living in a social world and we have to do these things, if we used it purely for that, instead of using it wrongly, we would be totally free and happy human beings. No concern for the future, no concern for the past, because we have neither. Do you think that the kingdom of heaven within lives in time? Not at all. Just my little petty personality that wants that raise, that wants the bigger home, that wants to impress you with how great I am, with how smart I am, how witty I am, so I remember that joke and bring it to the party. This little petty self that always wants to impress other people, or the little petty self that wants to be the victim. How many of you feel sorry for yourself all day long? Well, part of the day. Eh? Once in a while? <laughs> you do, and you know it. Who is the self that you're feeling sorry for? I will tell you that it doesn't exist except in your own imagination and in your own thinking incorrectly. Do you know tonight, do you know tonight that you have heard the secret of the ages, the secret of the way out, and I wonder how many of you are going to miss it. Don't you miss it. Don't you let this go. This will carry you all the way out. All right. If I use my mind properly in everyday things and don't get negative because I don't have a self that I'm trying to promote or protect or anything like that, then who am I? Because I used to tell myself all day long, all night long, who I am. I'm a happy person I'm a, or I'm a miserable person, whatever. I get no, no end to my self-descriptions. Then who will I be? Now we come to a point where words, my words, or your own words, your own descriptions and definitions cannot possibly do the work. Because you will be someone who is without words, someone who is without thoughts, someone without labels, someone without a future, someone without a past, because you're living above the intellect which does not have time. See, the, in, the time is subjective. It's on the level of thought. And if you don't have a self on the level of thought, but have this universal self, to call it that, this higher self, this new new birth that Christ talked about. If you have that, then you don't have to think about it, and you can't 
think about it. Because it's not to be thought about. It's to be known with cosmic consciousness. It's to be understood with a capital U. Now, what I just said, you didn't understand at all. And there's no way you can understand it until you go beyond thought, until you go beyond who you imagine you are, and disappear, disappear as a supposedly separate self, as this person with all these problems and all these ambitions and all these plans. Only as you disappear as the described self will you know what I'm talking about. But it is quite possible for you to know what I'm talking about. And then you know what? And this is very serious now. If you go this far, then your life will not have been lived in vain. I'm, I'm very much afraid that most of us have wasted too much time already in playing around with religious truths, with thinking that we're spiritual, with thinking, with thinking that by going north that we can find the treasure that's south. If the treasure is south, you have to go south, not go north. And if you're going north and calling it south, then you'll have an imaginary treasure. And it could be the fact that it could be the fact that presently your family life is secure, you have a nice husband, you have nice children, and they're no problem to you. And you have a nice income and a nice home, everything is rosy. Don't you know that you can have all these things and a thousand times more than that and still be a scared, shaky, insecure human being? Because every human being who has a million dollars and does not have God is scared. You know that. Millionaires jump off the bridge. Ladies in high society are sick and neurotic. You've been given the first step to something you can't imagine. But it does exist for you, for every one of you here. Look, don't you ever listen. Don't you ever listen to anyone outside of you or anyone inside of you that tries to take you off this one true path. And if you're observant, as I told you to be, you'll begin to see little imps inside of you that say, oh, it's too much work, or it's not worthwhile, or I already know the truth, I understood everything he was talking about. You catch these little imps in the act so that they don't grab you, and I've got you before you know it. or thought of some kind. You can see it coming from your toes practically and when you turn on the light, which you will understand what that is as you practice, as you develop, when you turn on the light that puts an end to that dark sour force right now and it can't take you over. This is what temptation is. The Looking at him because Darkness does indeed hate light. It doesn't want to come near it. But if you're asleep, you see, you're asleep, then you were in a state of darkness, and the devil looks up and he sees your darkness and he can creep up real fast. The time will come when you'll be able to catch him perhaps when he's right here at the, this one. Then maybe you can catch him sooner than that when he's behind the next one. Pretty soon you'll be able to catch him way, way back. You'll be able to catch him trying to take you over. For example, a, a, a depressed thought, a sour thought of some kind. You can see it coming from your toes practically. And when you turn on the light, which you'll understand what that is as you practice, as you develop. When you turn on the light, that puts an end to that dark, sour force right now, and it can't take you over. This is what temptation is, the, pre present, the appearance of the devil. But the minute you see it and put an end to it, because you're really living from your essence, from your true nature, from the kingdom of heaven within, when you look at it with that, it puts an end to that, the darkness. Okay, what would you like to talk about? Here, right down the middle of the aisle, way out, outside the building. Ten trees. And the devil, that is... I already know the truth. I understood everything. You catch these little imps in the act 
left so that they don't grab you and I've got you before you know it. I've often given the illustration up in our classes in Boulder City, Nevada. What we want to do, just to make it clearer to you, just picture 12 trees in a row. 12 trees, maybe a distance of 10 feet between them. 10 trees right down this aisle here, right down the middle of the aisle, way out outside the building. 10 trees. And the devil, that is our ignorance, the dark forces in us, our spiritual sleep, that's what the devil is, our hatred. So the devil tries to creep up and grab you, and he'll sneak up from one tree to the next real fast when you're not looking. He'll then, you know, he's a little closer, hiding behind the tenth tree, then the ninth, then the eighth, and he's getting closer to you. If we can develop our powers of alertness, of observation, which can be done, we can catch the devil while he's way back there at that tenth tree. And when you see him, that's the end of him, if you really do see it, because that's the light of consciousness. That's spirit, true spiritual light that puts an end to the devil. He can't stand it any more than the old Dracula movies. Dracula could sign the, could stand the cross, you know, the lady would hold a cross up or something and he'd fade back. The devil can't stand the light of you, your, your higher sense, your higher spirit inside of you, he can't stand you simply looking at him because darkness does indeed hate light. It doesn't want to come near it. But if you're asleep, you see, you're asleep, then you were in a state of darkness and the devil looks up and he sees your darkness and he can creep up real fast. The time will come when you'll be able to catch him perhaps when he's right here at the, this one, then maybe you can catch him sooner than that when he's behind the next one. Pretty soon you'll be able to catch him way, way back. You'll be able to catch him trying to take you over. For example, a, a, a depressed thought, a sour thought of some kind. You can see it coming from your toes practically, and when you turn on the light, which you'll understand what that is as you practice, as you develop. When you turn on the light, that puts an end to that dark, sour force right now, and it can't take you over. This is what temptation is, the, pre present, the appearance of the devil. But the minute you see it and put an end to it, because you're really living from your essence, from your true nature, from the kingdom of heaven within, when you look at it with that, it puts an end to that, the darkness. Okay, what would you like to talk about? Yes, Lydon. Are you suggesting then, Vernon, we invite the devil? Oh, he comes without invitation. You know why? Because our minds are on something else. For example, thinking about how badly I've been treated. When I think about that, that's not just an invitation of the devil, that is the devil. Why do I ever feel sorry for myself at all? Because my attention is on myself, and that's the one thing I falsely value most of all. When you understand what it means to slow down thought, as we talked about earlier, slow it down and, and put an end to self-centered thought, conceited thought, vanity thought. Put an end to that. That is the same thing as putting an end to the devil himself. Because as hard as this is on our vanity, the devil is not out there, is he? He's out there in other people, but guess where else he is? So this is where we have to work. So if you free yourself of all dark forces, don't you know that no dark force out there can penetrate you? This isn't religious talk again. This is a fact. If you have, look, look, if you have no anger in you, if you really have cleared yourself of anger, it will be impossible for you to get angry when another person attacks you. How can you? You're not on that level anymore. If you're up in the sky in an airplane, you're not involved with automobiles crashing into each other angrily down on the level of the, of the world, of the earth. Yes, please. I do something, I know when I do it, it's wrong. I know why it's wrong, but I still <coughs> keep repeating it, and that's to aggravate somebody until they become hysterical, and then I get all 
I don't know why I keep doing it. Did you say, do I make, make sure I understand, did you aggravate someone until they get hysterical? Why do you love the, the, the agitation inside of you? Do you know that I have explained it, and I like, I like your question very much because it came right to the point. And I'll explain it again. Use any other state for agitation, jealousy, anything. When I'm in a state of agitation, I'm going to put this down or I'm going to be throwing water because I, I feel a gesture coming up. <laughs> when I feel agitated over something, I have a marvelous, neurotic, sick excitement over it. Don't I? Huh? How about revenge? Haven't you noticed the fun of revenge, even if it's only mental? How many of you take mental revenge on people? Because they're because they're bigger than you are, right? Don't you know that you're injuring yourself when you do that? But back to the lady's question. All right. This lady in particular, and the rest of you in general, I'm going to give you a spiritual command. The spiritual command is this. You are never, never again, for the rest of your life, to scold anyone, to get irritated yourself and at them. You're never, ever to do it again. Now, how many of you think you're going to succeed? No one raise your hand. You're not going to succeed. I'm leading up to a point. You understand? You're not going to succeed because... The irritation you feel is the only you you've got. And you're not going to give you up. I'm trying to tell you. It is a developed you, a false you, a destructive you. And I'm trying to point it out. We're, we're seeing through the devil here tonight. So that we can have a bit of courage to say, I am not going to give myself a shot of irritation so as to feel myself alive. Have you ever noticed when you have nothing to crab about that you invent something? Huh? How many do that? We'll all raise our hand. All right. Why? Now, isn't that a strange situation? I have nothing to crab about, so I look at little Billy or big Billy, his father, and crab at them. Why? Because I love being a crab. For one thing, it can be very intimidating. I can make that, I hear as a woman, she's five feet two and her husband's six feet eight. She can make that big hulk jump. Huh? Sense of power. You ladies do this and you ladies do this to your nice husband. Do you, you see what we're getting at? There is such a thing, I'll put it the way we explain it up, up where we have our classes. Write down a sentence, those of you who like to write things down, and don't you ever forget this if you really want to get out of the trap. Write down the sentence, false feeling of life. Now a false feeling of life is any, 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 any negative state which gives you a false thrill, which seems to affirm you as someone who can sure make that husband jump, or someone who sure told the boss off, or someone, oh, if you've only known how much I've suffered, you're getting a false feeling of life out of that, and you're reinforcing your own misery. Try to detect a false feeling of life of any kind whatever, and simply, simply drop it right now. Just drop it. You won't succeed the first time. You won't succeed the first hundred times, the first five hundred times. Because just now you only have the knowledge without the strength to act properly in power on that knowledge. But as you understand all these things, then the truth itself will give you the power to be simply catch the devil behind the tenth tree back there, see it coming, and simply drop it before he hurts you. But look, 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 I'm trying to explain something to you. Getting hurt is what we love because we're afraid to be without it. You know people, maybe it's you, I don't know, but don't you know people who are always in trouble of one kind or another? 
always in debt, always having a fight with someone, always getting tickets, always having accidents. You know what I'm talking about. Their life is made up of this. Why? Don't you know that they unconsciously invite these problems because they're, it's no different than giving yourself a shot of dope of some kind, give you a quick thrill, because they're afraid to be without it. I will tell you, you begin to have the courage to begin to be without a false feeling of life. And it, it, I told you earlier, at the start, you'll be scared to do this because you're beginning to walk out of the known into the unknown. <clears throat> For a while, you quickly reproduce the known by thoughts, but to go on with it. <clears throat> the time will come when you'll see, to your astonishment and delight, that nothing bad, nothing bad will happen to you from giving up your supposed separate self. Nothing bad. What do you mean bad? It's been bad all our life. It can't get any worse. Not really. We hide it. We hide from other people. It's pretty bad inside. You will see that nothing bad can come as a result of following truth, of surrendering to truth, but everything good, what you really want. Then, then, you, then you can live a nice social life. You can be married or unmarried. You can have a lot of money or no money. You can have a family or no family. All these exterior things will make no difference because you will be in charge of your own life and will not be looking toward that husband or wife or money or activity or vacation. You will not be looking toward them to give you a thrill. You, you've abandoned those thrills that turn to pains every, every other day, right? You know that. You're happy one day and dejected the next. Instead, you're living, you're living for something that can be called cosmic command in which you go right out and you talk to your neighbor, you say, good morning, she says good morning to you, and you go to work, and maybe you have a flat tire, you pull over and you fix the flat tire, and you phone the boss, I'll be a little late, I had a flat tire, he says, okay. I mean, your life goes pretty much on the, pretty much on the everyday level, except that you don't have problems anymore, because you've had the courage, the courage and the intelligence to live without them. I'm telling you, now you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. You're not going to see the depths of it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. You are, you are madly in love with all your frustrations and your difficulties. I have, I have told you tonight for an hour and a half about that it is quite possible for you to be free of your problems, and theoretically at least, you could do it tonight. Do you know, do you know that if you were completely receptive, you could walk out of this room tonight, a new human being? You can do it. If you would surrender yourself, yourself being all your problems that you now love, it can be done. Hard work, to be sure. But look, uh, good news again. Nothing is more fun, more pleasurable, more real joy than tackling the dark forces inside of us that kept us enslaved. Nothing is more fun because you begin to sense, my God, thank God. Thank God after all these years, I, I'm on the right path. I'm on the path that leads from the desert down to the up to the top of the mountain. I'm not on the top of the mountain, for heaven's sake. I'm not halfway. I'm not even at the bottom of the mountain. I still have some desert to cross to get to the foot of the mountain in order to climb up. But one thing is sure. One thing is sure. I know there's something in me that knows that I'm heading in the right direction. I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall over the rocks, and I'm going to get discouraged, and I'm going to get thirsty. But sooner or later, I'm going to get to the foot of the mountain. And when I do that, when you do that, at that point, having done the preliminary work of crossing the desert to reach the foot of the mountain, when you start to climb, then you leave all the problems of the desert behind, all the problems of the spiritual desert, including being attacked by coyotes and wolves and wild cats and getting sand in your shoes and hair, all that is the thing of the past because you're not on the level of the desert anymore. 
This is very real. This can happen to you. No, the, uh, badness is unawareness of badness. If you become aware of badness, it disappears. Badness has no power in itself. Only as we, in our state of unconsciousness, spiritual sleep, see it as bad. And we see it as bad because I want to be either good or bad. And if I want to be either good or bad, I am all bad. I have no goodness of my own and I have no badness of my own in reality. It's very complex. Yes, please. My wandering mind took me away when you said what the devil and temptation, dark forces, what this means. What they are, they're simply states in us which are unconscious. This is why we're trying to become conscious, trying to become aware. If you want to use a spiritual term, that's fine too. Trying to become authentically spiritually minded, that's fine. Religious terms are just fine, or psychological terms. We're trying to see, now look, we're trying to see forces, dark forces that injure us that are unconscious in us. Now listen. Suppose I have a lot of hatred in me, right? Now, hatred, as well as all other negativities, are unconscious. Unconscious. I don't know I have them. I suffer from it. It burns me, and I can bop you because I have all this anger in me, but I'm not conscious of it. So, when you, you come out and you say, look, sir, you're kidding yourself. Do you know how much hatred you have in you? you know what my reaction is going to be? I'm going to hate you. Why am I going to hate you when you tell me that I'm hateful? Because it's unconscious. Now, that's not enough. Not, when I have an unconscious picture of myself, of being, an, of, of being if I am actually angry and hateful, that means that it's unacceptable to me because I have a picture of being a non-angry person, a good person. And I'm a marvelous actor. Boy, I can put the old smile on, and I can be patient when I'm burning and all that. If I can simply admit that you are right, that I have loads of suppressed hatred in me, if I can go through the shock of seeing that you are right, I will begin to shake the opposite of that, which is my image of being a non-hateful person. That is a good, loving, I love everybody, which is a big lie. But I go around saying that because I'm trying to convince myself of that because I don't want to see how much unloving I have in me. Are you following me? I'm having difficulty following myself. <laughs> because we're bringing these high truths down to the level of verbalization, which is very difficult. This means, essentially, I can get out of my hatred with one way. Well, there's a thousand ways, but I'll give you one of them. By being honest with myself to the point where it hurts. The next time you say, you know, sir, you've just loaded with hatred. And said, no, nah, who's loaded? You're loaded with hatred. You know, we always want, well, they, so are you. You know, little kids. We're all five-year-old kids. I slow down the reaction. And I say, it's, it's going to cause me a lot of pain. <laughs> I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it because I'm a loving person. I love everybody. You're right. I begin to suspect that I have a lot of suppressed hatred in me. All right. That, that, you know what that is when I said that with a little bit of sincerity, one-tenth of one percent? That was light. That was the light of God himself, which is honesty, which begins to look at the darkness of my hatred and begin to dissolve it. That's the only way out. But do you know that most people don't want to do this? They want to go into the false feeling life of getting angry when you, when you tell them how angry they really are.
streams. I want to climb up there. A million people, a billion people say, I want to climb the mountain. If you look a little bit higher than that and wait a little bit, you will see that on the next plateau up the mountain, there is a, maybe half the people who said, I want to climb up. Look a little higher and you'll see there's only half of them, a little higher, half of them. The higher you go, the fewer people are up there because they don't really mean it. Not only that, but they have taken, listen to this. When you say, I want to climb to the top of that beautiful mountain, how do you know what it's like up there? If you describe what that top of the mountain is like, you are describing it inaccurately. Not only that, but you are describing it out of your own conditioning, out of your own experiences, out of your own ideas, and out of your own demands as to what the top of the mountain should be like. To one of those million men down at the bottom of the mountain, the top of the mountain is to be a millionaire. To a woman down at the bottom of the mountain, the, the top of the mountain would be to have a lot of friends, nice friends you can have a little tea and cookies with and chat with and have a few friends so that you don't feel quite so long. That's her idea of the top of the mountain. You get a third person, uh, a young man perhaps, and his idea of the top of the mountain is the future. I don't have much now, I'm just out of college or high school, but I've got my eyes on being a lawyer, a doctor, a businessman, or military man, or whatever. And in just a few years, I'll be at the top of the mountain, and maybe I'll be a colonel in the army. Do you see the blunder we make from the very start? We describe the beauties of the top of the mountain according to our own desires, according to our own conditioning, and it's nothing like that at all. Because when you get to the top of the mountain, you can't have yourself with you. The very nature of the top of the mountain, where there's reality and where there's freedom, is the absence, is the absence of you. That is, the absence of the self that says, this is what the top of the mountain should be like in order to please me, in order to make me feel secure and happy. God says, no, go. Truth says, as you climb the mountain, if you're really going to climb it in reality and not just in imagination, which most people do, and then the top of the mountain is a hell to them. If you're going to climb to the top of the mountain, actually taking one small hard step at a time, every step requires something. And what it requires is the abandonment of part of what you have called yourself. That is, you, you take something as being valuable. What do you take? The security that your husband is still alive and he will take care of you and he will think for you. And on a certain physical level, he should and must, of course. He must take care of you physically and he must be a good husband and all that. But what if your husband goes? What if he leaves you? What if he goes away? Then you're going to be insecure because you're depending upon him instead of upon the truth itself. So while living with your husband or living with your wife or living with your occupation, whatever it might be, could we not drop the attachment to these exterior things, to these relatives, to these ideas we have as to what the top of the mountain is like? In other words, at every step, drop some false concept about ourselves in order to make our minds free to understand what the mountain is really like. And I'll guarantee you that it is not like what you and I have imagined it to be, and it is especially not what we demand it to be. Isn't that valuable for me? Isn't it valuable for you to see what a hypocrite we have been all our lives? Isn't that what truth requires of us? To see that we're hypocritical, which simply means we were divided. Don't go into moralization of hypocrisy, by the way. See it as a scientific fact. Hypocrisy means that there's more than one person inside of you. And with most of us, there's not just two or ten, there's about fifty changing, each one taking us over at a different time of the day, depending on what happens out there. We merely react in great joy when someone flatters our 
our new home, or in dejection when someone says, you didn't do your work very well, did you? Or you haven't accomplished much at your age of 40, have you? Most people are more successful than you. They wouldn't put it that bluntly, of course, but you get the hint of what they say. And you don't even realize that that's a sleeping human being saying that to you, and so you fall down underneath it and get discouraged and get dismayed and perhaps get angry. All because we don't understand that up to this point of our lives, We've been living from a bundle of mere ideas about ourselves instead of from the cosmic reality of who we really are. And who we really are, to describe it on the level of words, who we really are is an unseparate, unseparated part of the whole, capital W presently living in the physical flesh, which is temporary, which lives in time. But this true nature, this higher nature, does not live in time at all. Therefore, the physical body can go away, but the eternal spirit, and I'm not getting fancy, using fancy words or getting religious, but simply stating a fact that the, the true nature, your real nature, your spiritual nature, which does not live in time, lives in eternity. And with these truths that we've discussed so far this morning, and we'll continue to discuss, you'll be able to live in an astonishing state, which you will know as a fact whether any other human being does or not. You will know what it means to put an end to time as far as your nature is concerned. Not as far as the offices are concerned, because if the boss says be there at nine, you should be there at nine. If you have an appointment, for this or that at 12 o'clock, you better be there at 12 o'clock. So you live in time on the everyday level, and your real nature has nothing to do with that at all. It is way above it and free. Feeling like happiness. Yes, there is, and you know what it is? It's a state of understanding with a capital U a state of understanding that is not an intellectual idea of what happiness consists of. If I have an idea of what happiness is or what it will be when I attain this or that, if I have an idea of what happiness will be, I'm basing it on my self, my false self. Which means that it's going to be the victim of, the prey of, an opposite event that will depress the self. That is, I will alternate between what I call happiness, everything is going well with me, oh, a great day, Bus uh, made lots of sales, someone complimented me on something, uh, things are going fine, I've got something to look forward to tonight, there's a good movie on TV, Every, life feels good, right? life feels good. So I get home that night, and the, the show is canceled for a dull, boring program of some kind, already, already I'm not as happy as I used to be. And I get a telephone call of someone who made little remarks that I wasn't as uh, efficient or as nice as I thought I was. My happiness sinks a little bit more. If I have no idea of what happiness is, I will also have no idea of what unhappiness is, which is happiness without thought, which is happiness with a capital H, which is happiness without me being there. The I can never be happy. It can only have ideas of about, about happiness. Therefore, we'll swing over to the opposite and have ideas of what unhappiness is. We're trying to rise above the intellectual level, as we went into a good deal of detail last night. We're trying to rise above concepts so that we're not the victim of exterior events. There will not be positive or negative as far as we're concerned because there's no false self trying to promote itself or protect itself for the events to fall on. If I'm not there as a separate me, as an illusory me, if I'm not there, then events cannot touch me because I'm not at home. It's only when our vanity, our conceit, our false ideas about ourselves are there that they can be touched by exterior events. As you see, there are not 10,000 people here this morning to hear these truths. 
which is again evidence that most people don't want these truths. They want to hang on to their alternating swing between false happiness and false misery. And misery is just as false as false happiness because it has the same false foundation, which is a false sense of self. Get rid of your negative emotions and then you'll know whether or not there's something beyond them. But you have to find this out for yourself and don't describe them because you'll just be describing them according to what you already think are happy emotions. Happier emotions are when something good happens to me. A, a great problem I've had for three years. All of a sudden that great problem disappeared and I feel a great sense of relief. I call that happiness. That hasn't changed my nature. That hasn't uplifted my level of being. So I'll still have future problems. You know, if you want a sense of relief that will be abiding, that will last, then you take these truths and work on them. Because nothing is more relieving than to get rid of the burden of the artificial personality. Nothing is happier, more pleasurable than to not have to carry it around. That's real relief. You will find if you continue with these truths, as you begin to climb the spiritual mountain, you will find that you, you will get certain kinds of reliefs that are not faults. Certain kind of reliefs that are true and permanent and eternal. They are eternal. Because you can see the difference in the feeling inside of yourself than the relief you get when your neighbor quits throwing his trash over your fence. You see, that's just a little temporary foolish thing, isn't it? Because you're afraid that Wednesday, he stops throwing them over Wednesday, Thursday, he starts throwing them over again. And you don't know how to talk to him because you're afraid he's going to blow up at you. Well, you throw your, your leaves, come over on my area. There's a permanent relief consisting of not having, get this please, a, there is a permanent relief of not having to live with ourselves anymore. Of not having to live with that old burdensome nature. But we don't want to give it up because it's all we know. Find out what's beyond who you presently imagine you are. Find out what's beyond that and you will feel the relief that very few human beings ever experience because they don't want to go this far into the destruction of their artificial life. Some people, and you know people like this, just love their headaches, they love their nightmares, they love their complaints. This gives them something to do with themselves that seems worthwhile. Again, how, how strange, how peculiar that we demand our daily drink of strychnine. Try to take it away from a complainer, try to take the, the strychnine of complaint away from someone and watch how he fights you. He doesn't want to give them up. This is his life by which he destroys himself and also has no conscience toward anyone else. You and I have no right we have no right, I'm talking about spiritual rights now, we have no right to be a burden to any other human being through complaints, through crabbing, through demanding. And what, what I have done to myself first, I will automatically and unconsciously do to you where I have injured myself because of my lack of knowledge of spiritual truths, I have no choice but to injure you in the same way. Because my mechanical injury will extend itself to you. For ex a simple example, I have a problem down at the office with the boss, with my work, with someone I work with. Big problem. I come home and I talk to whoever is home there, and I say, do you know how badly I was treated down there? And I go into details and I rant and rave. I couldn't do it down there. I'd get fired. But I can come home and burden whoever I'm talking with, burden that person with my burdens. That person already has enough. You know what a conscience is? Real conscience? 
few people know what a real conscience is because most of us live in a phony conscience of phony moralities like giving a dollar to the Red Cross and then thinking you're wonderful for it. A real conscience means to be so free that you never pass on a negativity in any way whatever to any other human being. What do you suppose? I'll tell you what. After this meeting, you're going to go out shopping perhaps, or you're going to here or there, wherever you're going, and you watch people that you run into, maybe in your own home. You watch people and you tell yourself what their manner, even such a simple thing as their facial expression. You tell yourself whether that person is pouring out his burden onto the world or not, and you will see that he or she is because he has no choice to do it in his or her present state. And if this becomes very, very clear to you, it will help you not to be a, a burden to another person through complaining, through constantly talking about yourself, through unloading your problems on other people. Look, 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 look. What we're doing here this morning, the world doesn't want it. We are saying that we came to this meeting here this morning to sh begin to shatter our own prison. Or as the young man pointed out, begin to knock out the roof of this haunted house to let a little light in. Okay. You said, Vernon, that the way out is to explore yourself further. Would you explain the resistance we have in doing just that? The resistance to putting an end to the artificial self, the invented self, is the invented self itself. That is, I get my sense of who I am, I'm the great hero, or I will be the great hero, or I'm a criminal, a terrible criminal, Sam, I'm identifying myself. I get a sense of identity from thinking about who I am. Now thinking, ordinary thinking, is a very mechanical thing. And there's a certain law, I think it's Newton's law, that says a, a moving object, was. A, you roll a ball down that aisle, that ball will tend to keep moving, will it not, until something stops it. All right. This is the way with mechanical thought, too. It will continue to operate until something leaps in to stop it. In the case of the ball, it could be someone's foot, perhaps, or a chair, chair leg. Now, there's only one thing, one thing only, that will begin to stop the mechanical flow of ordinary thought, which is identity building and therefore self-destructive. The only thing that can do it is for us to work so long and so hard that we come to the point of seeing that of ourselves we cannot save ourselves. That is the I invested in ordinary thought cannot come to an end of itself. There's no way thought can operate on thought to come to an end of itself, to slow itself down in order to cease recreating the false I. When I have become quite convinced that I of myself cannot save myself, when I'm, listen, some of you are going to have to get a lot more miserable. When I get so sick, so miserable of trying to save myself, of seeing that it can't be done on the level of ego involvement, of building my little separate heavens. When I see it can't be done, I then go into greater fear because I sense, I sense what is necessary. And what is necessary is to come to the end of ordinary thought itself, which is the same as the death of the, of the pseudo-me, but since it's the only me I know, I fear to do that because I don't want to die. I want to be me. No matter how sick and miserable and hostile and afraid I am, I would rather be a, an afraid me than nobody. So I cling to that. I cling to that. I won't let anybody take away my hatred because that represents me, which is the way most people live and most people die. We're going to do better. I get to the point where I, I say, listen, listen to this and understand it in the right way, please. I say to myself after years and years of trying to do it by myself, trying to save myself, I say, you know, my life isn't worth living going on in this way anymore. I used to convince, try to convince myself that it was, that that new acquisition or this change of plans, someone liking me. I used to think that that was my salvation, that it could help me at least feel a little bit better. 
I can no longer lie to myself. I can no longer deceive myself. I must see, as shocking as it is, as fearful as it is, that I cannot rescue myself. Do you know, do you know that religious truth, real religious truth, are right after all? You may have scorned them. I'm telling you that they are right after all. Only, only one thing can save us. And you want to call it God? That's fine. You want to call it truth with a capital T? That's fine. You want to call it reality, capital R, cosmic kind? When we begin to see that you cannot save yourself, then you become willing to slow down thought that is, is creating you, and you begin to fade out of the picture which gives God Almighty a chance. As you begin to falsely use thought to create a false self and then try to perpetuate that self, when, when you see the futility of it, when you see that it's an impossible game because you can't create an illusion and you can't perpetuate an illusion, you can just look at it and call it real, but you're still thirsty like when looking at a mirage. I don't care how many times you say that's, that's a lake out there. That's not, it's a lake. It's a lake. You go up and try to drink from that lake, and you find out it's just a mirage in front of your eyes. It's, you're going to have to get to the point where you're seeing that's just an illusion. It's not a lake, and I'm going to have to stop lying to myself. If you reach this point where even in a small way you begin to slow down thought, so that it ceased to recreate yourself quite so fast. This slowing down then gives an opportunity for light to creep through. And that light creep through will give you your first sensing of what it means to be born again, really, not according to these phony Christians that you read the books about, but really, really be born again because you have, listen please, because you have first died. That is the order in which it goes. You must first die in order to be born again. If you say, I'm simply born again because I went to church or I went to a religious meeting and got converted. If you say that, you're still an angry, scared human being. And your book may sell a million copies and you may become a millionaire. But you are still a lost human being calling yourself saved. Do you understand? Look, look. And then we'll go on with one or two more questions and we'll stop. In spite of all the terror of it, in, all, in spite of all the difficulty of it, in spite of all the pain and the fear of doing it, we have got to stop deceiving ourselves. God has a chance to enter in and do for you or for me what we couldn't do for ourselves when we make up our mind regardless of what happens to me, I'm going to stop telling lies about who I am and what my life is all about. The angels will applaud if you do that because they see an individual finally coming to the end of himself and then God has a chance. Please, please understand all of you before we leave here, please understand that these, that these things we've talked about are not just as practical as that wall that holds the roof up but a thousand, a million times more practical because they count for eternity, not for just keeping the building up here for a few years, keeping this body in place for a few more years. But these truths will last for eternity. Do we have any last questions or comments? Um. Vitality. Ah, ah, yes. How many of you drain yourself of energy all day long? Huh? Huh? You see how the question is answered just in that one response by you. We drain ourselves of all this vitality, all this energy that we could be channeling into self-discovery, self-knowledge. I'll tell you, I've got good news for you. Inside of every one of us here in this room is the, in, in, in a slumbering state, of course, is the energy, the vitality of the universe, the kingdom of heaven is within. But the doors are closed because of our own vanity and wanting to be someone separate from us. As you begin to work on these truths, you will begin to save energy for the tasks of self-awakening instead of squandering it and getting mad and getting depressed and getting this or that. As long as you're wasting energy in that, there's no way you can... look. You're, if you have five dollars, if you throw it out into the field there, you can't buy groceries with it, one or the other. 